I am blessed every day of my life. I am blessed when I wake up in the morning. Oh, I lay me down to rest every day. I am blessed. I am blessed. I am blessed. You are blessed. And I tell you what, if we can just think more about how blessed we are, then we will leave no room for how stressed the world is suggesting that we should be. I remember learning that song way back when. I don't remember exactly when I learned it, but I know it's maybe it was kind of like in the mid 80s somewhere in one of those house meetings that we used to go to. I was so little when everyone stands up to sing, you couldn't see me. So I had to be mindful of people, you know, when they're falling under the power of the Holy Spirit so that they do not crush me. But thankfully, it was the 80s. People were still very skinny then. Remember the 80s wherein everybody and, <laughs> and their dog was very slim. <laughs> oh, yeah. But then at the same time, I was still so little. I was mindful. I, I'm just having those pictures right now come straight to my uh, memory or, or to, my, to, my, to my mind. But then those were great moments. And I'm glad, for the, glad and thankful to God. I said gladful. Uh, you can start using that word. I think it's a good word. Glad and thankful. It becomes gladful. Um, yes, I am thankful because we don't have to look back and say the good old days because right now we're having house meetings once again. We have fellowship meetings springing up in different places, you know, all around the world. Um, some people affiliated with us here um, organizationally at Communion House are experiencing great things. And some people that are just friends that we know about in other parts of the world are reporting on this awesome revival that has begun in homes. I personally like to call it the Obed-Edom revival. Uh, at Communion House, we typically call it house to house movement. Uh, but then I like the word Obed-Edom because that was somebody in the Bible that was such a great example in the Old Testament of having the presence of God in his home followed by such an immense blessing. And, and it was something that didn't just transform his own family situation or his, his own household but then it started a revival of, of health and wealth across the land. And I'm talking about spiritual soundness and restoration of relationship with the Lord. And the key, the Lord said to me, is in the name of that man, Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom means the one who serves the other man. I'm telling you, it is time for us to stop raising a generation of Christians who just want to be served with good music, good acting, and good speaking, but people who would commit themselves to opening the door of their homes to serve other people, to tidy up before they come, to prepare something to share, and to allow themselves to become an avenue for someone else to experience the manifestation of the, gift, of the gifts of the Spirit in their own lives. What do I mean by that? There are people that have always known that there is a call upon their lives to prophesy. You know, but then when you are in a large gathering of people, you, you're not, it requires a different kind of confidence to begin to prophesy. But when you come into the home setting or when you're in just your home between you, your wife and your children, you have another new to say, you know what, this is what I believe the Lord is saying. And as the passage of time is experienced, we can tell if truly what you heard, you have heard from the Lord. So it is great to be here today um, as Part of the House to House broadcast, this is what we call House to House Live. And the, the joy of it is you can play this clip in your home and have your children or your friends or your neighbors watch it with you. Or you can just watch it by yourself and then and just pretend like I'm in the room with you. So two or three of us are gathered in your home in his name and the presence of God is guaranteed. My name is Moses Anderson, lead pastor here at Communion House, and it is the pleasure of my life and the joy thereof to be able to come in here and share with you moment by moment the things that the Lord is revealing to me. Because very clearly, we are living in the, in the very best times. These are the very best times. These are the times that the apostles looked forward to. These are the times that the men of old, men of renown, men who were known to have had a relationship with God, these are the days that they looked forward to when the heavens are as open as they are right now and there is an abundance of revelation and there is no shortage of the unction with which to speak the mind of God. But more importantly, you know, more importantly is also the grace and the attentiveness to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. For the Bible says, let him who has an ear, 
hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. Oh God, I am excited and I'm just so thankful to God for having uh, you know, orchestrated my steps to walk this particular segment of time. It is such a joy. Now, some of the things that I describe, if you're not experiencing them just yet, don't be discouraged, just be encouraged, be motivated. Let, let these testimonies, let them ignite faith in you. Let them create within you the hunger and the thirst to long for the revelation, to hear the voice of God. And it's as simple as paying attention because when you pay attention, you will hear what God has to say. Remember back then, for those of you who, or who were uh, believers from the 80s or 90s, uh, you would remember this song that we sang in some of our meetings, that God has something to say. If you would listen and pay great attention, you will hear this word. You see, God has something to say, and if you would listen and pay great attention, I may have modified the song just the way I remember it, but then you get the gist. If you would listen and pay great attention, God has something to say. So today, we will be continuing the series. Actually, before we get to continue the series, I have an amazing announcement to make. So if, if you're not sitting down properly, sit down properly. Fasten your seatbelt because this excitement may knock you off your seat. And you know what that is? For quite some time now, especially toward the end of 2020, we've been enjoying a Sunday morning gathering here at Communion House here in Sugar Hill. So the Sugar Hill gatherings become a Sunday gathering and that's the meeting at our house here in Communion, I mean here in Sugar Hill, Georgia. But very soon, I'm telling you that very, 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 very soon, we will be adding yet another meeting to the Sunday worship. And that is going to be the most loved and cherished and missed, the Tuesday house to house. The Tuesday house to house is returning with more intimacy than ever before is returning for the prophetic. It is returning for the fellowship. It is returning for the waiting. And what I mean by the waiting is that is one meeting, you know, that we, we always come with that meeting with such an expectation to experience that outpouring, that outpouring, you know, just like the wind of the power of the Lord in the person of the Holy Spirit fills the upper room. It's the way we will experience it here. It's been foretold. It's been prophesied. We have seen it. We have had a glimpse of it. We've had actually tastes of it. And that is the reason why I am beyond excited to let you know that Tuesday House to House returns. And we will let you know the details and, and the exact Tuesday that is going to be kicking off. I've got some other people like me who are just so excited, right on the edge of their seats, waiting with bated breaths just to experience that Tuesday house to house all over again. You know who you are. And for those hearing it now for the first time, I bet your excitement is brewing as well. God is good. And if it isn't, examine your heart. Because the Bible says, David speaking, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Once again, like I said, we will be continuing a series today that we've been on for some time. And it's been one of my favorites so far. And it is the series, The Real Estate of Heaven. I was trying to wrap it up. But then one of those Sundays, or I think it was a Saturday night meeting, I was speaking about the real estate of heaven. And I just started to mention some other things that God had shown to me about the real estate of heaven and felt the need to uh, continue. And while I was yet continuing, I said to the people, I said, okay, you know what? I promise I'm going to do one more on the real estate of heaven. And I'm going to title it, How to Say Goodbye and Be Happy. Wow. You know how good, tough goodbyes can be sometimes. Especially when you've being or when you become accustomed to a particular situation or status quo and you need to say goodbye you know that house that you once lived in and you loved so much you had two or three of your children in that house you had such an emotional attachment to that house and when it was time to move you couldn't even see yourself leaving that place uh, you see, that could go two ways. You could be leaving it and be happy to be finally leaving it behind. Maybe you guys have been struggling to make it work because you've run out of room. You know, that could be one scenario when you're struggling to leave it. I mean, when you're excited to leave it behind. 
But another scenario is like, man, you're like, man, I don't want to leave this place. I don't want to leave these amazing neighbors. We don't have to relocate. I wish this can pass and we don't have to do this. And so there are two, two kinds of reactions that we typically get when it's time to say goodbye, particularly in the context of real estate. But today, because we are in that place or at that place now as the body of Christ, we're in a transition and what I would call a relocation or a relocation is very imminent, is very imminent, is in is very is impending as they would say upon us we are about to have a relocation from here to there we've had a translation which is what the bible says that the lord god almighty in the in his goodness and the love that he has for us by his by by his love allowed for us to be translated from the kingdoms of the world into the kingdom of his dear son jesus christ and so we've been translated from where we were renting from the prince of this world who kept changing the terms of our contract all the time because he doesn't see, he, he, God is the one that is called the holy God who has the integrity, who doesn't change hands, whose words are always true. You know, but when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with the prince of this world, you know, you sometimes don't know what to expect. You see what I mean? And so when, while we were yet renting in the hand of, of, of the prince of this world, of the enemy, or the adversary, as Jesus calls him, uh, we, we didn't have the most pleasant of experiences. But then God in his goodness allowed for us to be translated into the kingdom of his dear son, wherein we're no longer renters. We're now co-owners of this kingdom, of this property, of this real estate. The Bible says that we have now become co-heirs together with Christ Jesus, who in fact was the firstborn amongst many brethren. And so because we are born as siblings, of him unto the Almighty God, we are co-owners of this new real estate that we occupy. You see what I mean? So we've had the translation, but now we're about to have a relocation because all of us are about to be taken up and positioned in a new Jerusalem, a new earth, a new world. You see, in this new world, one of the things about this new world is, it's interesting how the Bible begins in Genesis chapter two, which is the second chapter of the book of Genesis, talking about Eden or the garden that we call the Garden of Eden. He talks about Eden, of course, and then he talks about the garden. And then I've talked about the relationship between the garden and Eden, how Eden is the source of the garden, how the garden itself cannot fulfill its purpose and flourish without being connected to Eden. And then we saw that the connection between the garden and Eden is a four tributary kind of connection, a river that then becomes four tributaries or four river heads. And we mentioned those rivers. We talked about Pison, we talked about Opishan, we talked about Hydeco, we talked about Gihon or Gihon, and we also talked about the Euphrates. And all, of course, the various impl I mean, significances of these rivers in our lives. And if what I'm saying right now sounds like Greek or Latin to you, I implore you, catch up on these videos. There have been five or six of them so far. I think we had a part one, two, three. Uh, one of them was taught by our outreach pastor, Will Holiday, and then we have four, five A and five B. So we've had total number, in total, six teachings on the real estate of heaven. And this is the seventh one, the grand finale, maybe, who knows what's going to happen afterwards. But for now, uh, we're calling it the grand finale is the number seven. And you see, if these things are Greek to you, go and watch those things on the Communion House YouTube page or Facebook page. Uh, YouTube channel or Facebook page or perhaps even on Spotify or Apple, um, what do you call it, iTunes uh, podcast. I mean, there are so many ways by which you can catch it. And if you're a Google faithful, you can check it on Google Cast as well. Just type in Communion House and you can't go wrong. And if those things are not your thing and you're a web website um, aficionado, you can just go to communion.house and right there you can see the real estate of heaven and you can listen to all of it. I'm telling you, it's one of the most amazing truths and secrets that we have as believers. You know, in fact, they're like weapons. When you understand the rudiments of the real estate of heaven and how it operates here on the earth, you will, I'm telling you, it, it's life-changing, it's life-transforming, can't recommend it any, I mean, can't over-recommend it, it is really good, you catch up with it. But what I was saying is when we started, we started from the book of Genesis, from the second chapter where it talks about the, the Garden of Eden as the very first real estate that was introduced to us that was tangible from our perspective. The very first real estate that was mentioned in the Bible is called heaven. The Bible says in the beginning, 
Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. He talks about the heaven first and then the earth. And then the Lord described the mirror scenario in, in the object of the firmament to let us know that the earth itself is meant to be a reflection of heaven. And God started uh, with a garden that was meant to grow and then man was supposed to tend it and see it flourish and then eventually have an entire world that is actually as a, a, a beautiful garden that is beautiful for situation or for habitation. Uh, but we know what happened you know, to all that initial plan. Um, or that initial experience. The plan stays on, is a salvation plan. Nothing ever hinders that. But at least the initial project, we saw what began or what became of it. But the second chapter is where we started to see the description of the garden. And interestingly, in most of the Bibles that we have, the last book is the book of Revelation. And the second to the last chapter of the book of Revelation introduces us yet to another kind of real estate, and it's called the new Jerusalem. So God did create a new heaven and a new earth. In, in Revelation 21, we see that. And then of the new earth, which is called the new Jerusalem, um, there, was, there was such a beautiful description of, of what lies ahead of us. Okay, so the, the concept of being able to say goodbye and be happy is essentially that. What I'm looking to do today by the grace of God is show you where you're at and show you where you're going. So that when you see the difference between where you're at and where you're going, saying goodbye to this world as it is right now, will no longer be a sad thing for you. You will no longer hold on to this world as much as you've been holding on to it. You will no longer hold on to this life as you've been holding on to it because at the end of the day, whether you hold on to it and sink your teeth into it, the time is coming when you would have to let go and embrace eternity. You see? And now, having to embrace eternity, you could do it in many ways, but the best way to do it is to embrace it with anticipation and to receive it receive it with much joy. You see, that's the way to do it. Jesus did it that way. Jesus, when he was about to say goodbye to the earth, the Bible says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the goodbye process because the bye-bye process of Jesus was being nailed to the cross. Remember when he was at the cross, that was when he said his goodbyes. He looked at his mother and he looked at his beloved friend and he says to them, man, I love you guys, but then y'all have each other now. He says, mother, behold your son, son, behold your mother, and then goodbye to you guys because I'm out of here. You see what I mean? It was a very painful process. Even he cried as he was saying the goodbye. But then the Bible says that in, in the depths of his heart, the real core of him was rejoicing because of the fact that he knew what was ahead of him. Isn't that awesome that we have such, an, such a great example to follow? And Paul came in to, even, to, to, to further establish or clarify that process of being able to say goodbye to this world because of the uh, joyfully and happily because of the fact that you've had an insight into the next. How did he say it? He said, look, uh, for me to live is Christ. While I'm here, it's not, it's not awful, okay? I'm having a great time because I have peace. I have joy. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. They could lock me up in prison. That doesn't even hinder my joy in any way, if anything at all. It fuels my experiences as a believer uh, to, 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 to uh, propel me in the direction of the experiences of Christ, okay? So the guy was having a great time nonetheless. Look, he went through the shipwrecks and all the chaos, and, and he was attacked by animals, but he was still having a good time. Okay, so when you're, when you're sitting where you're at now and you're thinking about all the political turmoil, about all the, all the pandemic and all of what's going on and, and potential economic downturns and all of that stuff, and you're feeling bad, no, you're doing it wrong. You're supposed to observe those things, but you're not supposed to look at or look to those things. You can observe them, but you need to keep looking to the things above because all of the things around you are temporal. So I say that to encourage you just in case you're, you're finding it difficult to make sense of 2020 and now you're not even sure what expectations to have of 2021. I want you to be encouraged that the ones who lived before you, who wrote those beautiful Psalms that you like to read like David and who wrote those epistles that you like to quote and memorize and profess. You see like Paul, they went through very difficult times. They went through very challenging situations. They were hated by people. They were they were, they were persecuted, they were tormented, they suffer all kinds of losses in the natural, 
but they never let any one of those things keep their focus away from the heavenly Jerusalem. In fact, in David's case, he just couldn't stop thinking about the beauty of God's presence. You see, when the enemies were after him, when his wives were scheming and his children were scheming against him, when all of that was going on, he kept on saying that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord. And so if the world around you is not as palatable as you want it to be, it is an indicator that you're not spending enough time in the presence of God. So spend time in the presence of God, spend time seeking his face, and you will behold the beauty of the Lord. Let me even tell you this. Jesus said, <laughs> he said, um, I believe it's, in, it's still in the same Revelations 21. He says, the ones who overcome, I will make them pillar, pillars. They will become like columns in, in, in the house of my father. They will become like columns. They will don't have to worry about going anywhere. They will dwell therein all the days of their lives. In fact, I'm going to write my new name on them and they will be there all the time. And so if your destiny, eternal destiny, is that you will be in the house of the Lord all the days of your life, why don't you start practicing now? Being in the presence of God. I mean, it is your eternal destiny. I mean, there is no other, there's, there's nowhere else to go. You will be in the house of the Lord all the days of your life, you know? And so let's begin to practice. Let's begin to get ourselves accustomed to being in the presence of God. When you spend time in the presence of God, I, I, I was telling this yesterday, I was saying this yesterday, that I see a lot of people who want to hear the voice of God. Okay, and they have such a great desire to hear the voice of God. And they keep asking me, man of God, how can I hear God? I mean, I want to hear God. I know you hear God. I mean, the things that you have prophesied over me have come to pass. The things that you have prophesied over the nation, over the land has come to pass. That's so we know for a fact that you do hear God. And so how can we hear God like you hear God? And my, my recommendation has always been the same. Of course, I tell people, study the word of God. Understand the way God has spoken to people in the past. By studying the Bible, by, written, by reading what's already written, you understand the vocabulary of God and, and or of heaven, if you would, and, and you appreciate, you know, uh, the, 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 the alphabets of, of, of God's way of speaking. And, and that becomes a building block for your own communication when it comes to your relationship with God. So I say that, okay? So, but then in addition to or further to being able to sit yourself down and study the word of God is also being able to speak to God. You see, if you want to hear God speak to you, you should be ready to make sure that God can hear you speak to him. Can I say that again? To hear God speak to you begins with God hearing you speak to him. Sometimes he comes to us first. Okay, we know people who are not particularly talking to God, all right? But God comes and speaks to them. People like Samuel. But that was because very largely, I would say, his mom had already spoken to God. And so God was continuing that conversation because we can enjoy the blessings of those who have come before us. So for some of you, because somebody somewhere is interceding for you, you get to hear the voice of God even before you have opened that channel of conversation. But generally speaking, we are more guaranteed of hearing the voice of God when God hears our voice. When you go to God and you start talking to him, you will hear what he is saying. Many people who say they want to hear the voice of God have not even established that relationship or demonstrated that commitment in the place of them perpetually speaking to God. God speaks in such a perpetual fashion. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord speaks expressly, which means perpetually, consistently, and continuously. And so if you want to be heard by God, you need to be speaking also expressly back to God. And so don't speak to God one day, you pray on Monday, and you don't pray again until Monday of next of, of the same month next year. Don't speak to God only in summer, and then God does not hear from you again until the next fall. You see, when you speak like that, you're not speaking in the way God speaks. So if you truly want to hear God, you need to learn how to speak expressly. Learn how to pray in the Spirit for hours. Learn, learn how to, to pray all the time. Sometimes when I'm having conversations with people, I'm talking to people, I'm praying. You can ask Pastor Will, quite often he's talking to me, but I'm praying. Not, uh, not, not as a, it's not in a rude fashion to say that I'm, I'm ignoring him or uh, I'm trying to uh, pretend like I'm not interested in the conversation. But it is such that I can hear what you're saying, I can communicate with you, but in my heart I'm, already, I'm having a conversation with God still. 
You see what I mean? And so I just dropped that in there as a nugget, okay, for some of y'all who have been saying, oh, Pastor Moses, you keep saying since 2020, especially that the heavens are so open, that revelation is coming out like much, like lots and lots of people, but I haven't heard anything, I haven't seen anything. Well, that's for you. You see, so the way you're saying you haven't heard anything and seen anything, God is also saying the same thing about you. It's like, oh, where's Joe Blue? I haven't heard from him or seen anything of him. And some angel might say, you know what? Maybe I think it was the spring of 92. We, he dropped in a prayer, but we haven't seen him since then. And God is like, well, that's not what we do. We speak expressly around here consistently without, uh, well, w w without reserve or without, you know, without relenting. You know, the Bible says, I believe in uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5 or 17, and it might be Second Thessalonians, the Bible says, um, pray without season. You know, Jesus says men ought always to pray and not to faint. So the secret to hearing God is to always pray. Not pray once in a while, but always pray. Because when you always pray to a God who is always speaking, then you will always hear. It is just very simple arithmetic. It's not even mathematics in this regard. It's simpler than math. It's arithmetic. You know, you speak to God always because he speaks always. And then you can hear him always. Jesus said it this way. He said, Father, I thank you because you hear me always. Now, why would Jesus say you hear me always? Because he is always talking to the Father. Okay, so that's a nugget on hearing from God, and I hope it blesses your life. You know, I've, I've been teaching this hearing from God for the longest. However, I think that is the simplest I've been able to communicate it, which is you speak to him always because he speaks always. Always is the language of heaven, and once you speak always, then you understand always. Isn't that awesome? God is good, and thank you uh, for helping me out there with that screen projection. It is First Thessalonians. I was right the first time around. <laughs> uh, yes, God is good. So um, here we are. We're going to be talking about this new Jerusalem today. You know, I've spent quite a bit of time talking to us about the, the, about the first garden, right? And then we're going to talk about this new world that is coming, this new real estate. The significance of that, if I haven't lost you in that hearing from God nugget, is that you, when you see into the joy of the new Jerusalem, you will then begin to learn how to let go of this world. You begin to unlearn some of the things that you have become addicted to and dependent on in this world. Does it make sense? Because you need to divorce yourself from the earth and from this current world system in order for you to be married to the next system. So you can't commit that kind of crime here. God does not allow that. You need to first of all sever the ties with this one to embrace that other one. It's like for most of us, when we're buying a new house, we typically have to sell our home, uh, the, the existing one, to buy a new one. But even the people who don't have to sell this one to buy that one, they still need to move from this one to live in that one. You can't build a new house and continue to live in an old one and expect to enjoy the new house. No, you can enjoy the thought of having it as, a, as an asset, but then you don't enjoy living in there. To live in there means you need to vacate this one to move into that. And in order for you to be able to do that with joy is to know what, I, what is ahead of you. And to know what is ahead of you is to have put something ahead of you. Jesus says, lay up treasures for yourself in heavenly places where moth and wrath do not corrupt. And so today, um, I'm actually thinking this might bleed into another teaching, but if, if, if I may, I want to give you um, two perspectives very quickly. One of them is what I've been talking about, which is to see the joy or to receive the joy of the new Jerusalem that is set before you. And then the second one, if I may mention very briefly, is how to invest in the real estate of heaven in such a way that you're always making profit. Let me give you a, a natural example, a worldly example. In the world, there are people who are very skilled at buying dilapidated properties, properties that are run down. They become so skilled at buying properties that are run down, investing in it, and making it new. Okay, I, I just, let me say that again. While I was saying it, I gave away the secret. Many people have become very skilled at buying an old property that is dilapidated and then turning around to make profit on it when they sell it. The people who do that and make the most profit are the ones who know how to make it new. 
So you buy something that is run down and then you make it new and then you make profit on it. So when the Lord God Almighty made the earth, at the beginning, it was new, it was nice and dandy, but then corruption came and the faucet stopped working. Corruption came and the gas cooker, gas cooker stopped working. Corruption came and over the passage of time, the tiles in the bathrooms, the tiles in the bathrooms became outdated. And then the value of the earth continued to plummet and plummet and plummet and plummet. And what did God Almighty himself, what did he say? The Bible says in, let's, in fact, let's read it together. I, I think at this point we, we should do a little bit of reading. So once again, it's one of those messages. You need to listen to it again, separate the hearing from God part, and then come back to the real estate one. And when you get to the real estate one, you also take the part of it that talks about knowing the joy that is before you and put that as another segment. And then the third segment of your notes is this one that I'm going to actually be getting into, which is how to increase the value of your real estate. Okay, because at the end of the day, we were made by God to be profitable. Jesus says every unprofitable servant is cast into a lake of fire. If you are unprofitable, the Father will approach you because he made you in his image and in his likeness. And when God made you, even you are a real estate investment. Because God says, the Bible says that we are his tabernacles, we are his buildings. So he set us up and we are the planting of the Lord that the Lord might be glorified. The word planting there is the word investment. We are the investment of God that he may make profit. So the prof profit in heavenly terms is glory. So if God made you to be profitable, he also expects you to be profitable. He made you in his image and in his likeness and is a God that does not lose. He's a God that profits. And so you need to learn how to profit when you invest in the real estate of your destiny and in the real estate of the kingdom of God that is in your heart. Okay? So that is, that is guaranteed expectation. God wants you to be profitable. So what I'm about to show you, folks, is God's method of profiting from real estate that has lost its value. Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What that means is if you know glory to mean profit, it means all have been corrupted because that's what sin does and lost value such that you have now lost profit. Does that make sense? So this is what God did to ensure that that which has lost profit gains profit. And to gain profit is to gain value. And to gain value is to Watch this. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Now, Revelation 21, I'm going to start reading from verse 1, and I, I, I can read this thing again and again. I can even read it 30 times. I'm telling you, like, it's so sweet. Now, this is what it says. It says, now I saw a new heaven whoo, and a new earth. I am glad because I can actually say this to the glory of God, that I saw the new heaven and the new earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And for those who know, they know. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Just like the first one came out of God, came out of heaven. What it to come out of something means to be patterned after that thing. The first earth was patterned after the heaven. And that was why when God was done making it, he looked at it and he said it is good. You cannot say something is good without a reference point. And heaven was that reference point. So God said, behold, it is good because it meets the conditions of the reference point. Okay? And so this one is exact same way. It's coming out of heaven. Now here again, here's what the Lord says. The, Lord, the Bible says here, verse 3, I have heard. No, let's even finish reading verse 2. It comes down from heaven from God and prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I'm going to come back to verse 2 because there is a discrepancy or there is a misconception that has gone in on for too long about this new Jerusalem being called the bride of Christ. And I want to resolve that today very quickly, but I'll come back to it. But for now, I want you to see where I am going. Okay. Now, God in verse four, um, the Bible says in, in verse three, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, 
Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So God is saying, you know what, that other real estate called the garden. I didn't live there. I used to visit there. God says, the Bible says, and God would come down in the cool of the evening to visit Adam, to visit with the man. And at some point before he came to visit, corruption came in to visit, deception visited, and man was corrupted. And this time around, God is saying, that's not going to happen again because this time around, I'm actually going to live with y'all. Aren't you excited? This is one of the reasons why no matter what is going on in the world, I am so excited because I'm like, you know what? This world is already corrupt and the Bible says it will perish and it will pass. And thankfully, I am born again. I have a citizenship of heaven. When this world perishes, I'm not going to be here. Heaven is going to come and rescue me before this thing perishes. Just like the United States government rescues its citizen from, citizens from any country that is going through some kind of perishing. Maybe they have a war going on. You see the Americans, you see American troops going there and working with the embassy to rescue the Americans that are there because they don't want them to perish with that country. That country is going through its own mess. You don't have to, our people don't have to perish with you, we rescue them. And that is what's going to happen. So for those of you who don't believe in the rapture, well, there you have it. You see, the reason why we're going to be caught up to meet with him is because this world is perishing and we're going to be caught up to meet with him. And then when this old mess is cleared out and a new heaven comes, we'll come down with it to come and rule and reign. Okay, does it make sense now? So here is what God is saying. God is saying, look, I'm not going to leave room for some kind of serpent to come in and, and, and steal away your joy and corrupt you while I'm gone. I am going to be living with you all. We're going to be doing this. It's kind of like permanent. Okay, and you know what happens when you live? You, you, let me even quickly give you this example. A friend of mine a while ago, he bought a house and he loved the house and uh, but then he went back to do his MBA and started learning about how people invested in real estate and decided, oh, you know what? To make an investment is to buy another property and then put renters and this one that I loved so much. But, you know, that's how other people would love it too. And they would be willing to pay what I'm asking for it in monthly rent. So he went to buy a lesser house for himself. And he was staying in there and he rented out this house that he loved so dearly. And you know what happened was, he spent money to make it look good and all of that good stuff. And every now and again, they were checking on them. But, the, but he realized after a while, and he called me, he was like, he said, man, dude, this house has been run down by the tenants that are living in there. It's lost value. They've broken stuff. It is a mess. I'm like, that same house that I came to check a while ago when you were done fixing it up, he was like, man, they've ruined it. So... What are you going to do? I asked him. He says, oh, I'm moving back in there. I'm moving in back into that house. And he moved back into that house and fixed it up again. And the house picked up in value because that was where he lived. This world was given to Adam by God to live in it. And God will visit. But then be between Adam and Satan, they kind of ran it into the ground. And God was like, okay, this time around, because you're my son, I'm not going to throw you out. You need a place to live. I'm going to build a new one, and we're going to live in there together. And this time around, no one's going to run it down, at least not on my watch, because I'm going to be there. So this is what's going on with this new Jerusalem. God is the guarantee for the success of this new world. And so what does he say here? He says, I'm going to be there. I'm going to live in that place, and you'll be my God, and I'll be your God, and you'll be my people, and we're going to do this right. And verse 4, we're going to do this together forever. Verse 4 says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write these things, for these words are true and faithful. When you add true and faithful, <laughs> what do you get? <laughs> it's heaven. Amen. And so God said, this one in particular, I want you to write it down because I want the children of men, I want my sons and my daughters to know how I operate. Write it down. It is for their own education. Write it down. And what do I want you to write down? I want you to write down that the way I increase the value that can then be eternal to build a real estate that is immune to corruption is to make everything new. Again, I'm not fixing things that are broken. No. I am making all things new. 
Many of us today, we are so dedicated to our political systems because we believe that if we elect the right officials, they can fix things. And you're correct. You are absolutely correct. When we have the right people in office, they can fix things. When we appoint the right people, when we create the right environment, we can fix things. But God is saying, I am not in the business of fixing things. I am in the business of making it all new. It's been a while since I've stopped praying for God to fix the world. Because the more I study the word of God and the more that I understand prophecy, the more I recognize that God is not in the business of fixing things. He is in the business of making all things new. Amen. And that is the reason why, look, someone says, but does that mean that you're giving up on the world? Well, you can say that. But I'm not giving up out of nonchalance. It's not because I am nonchalant about what God is doing and I don't care. I am saying, no, I'm already holding on to God's way of doing things, which is to make all things new. And so he is making all things new. And so that is the reason why my focus should be on this new Jerusalem that is called the Bride of Christ. Now let me put the two together. Okay? In fact, let me put the three things together. You know, I gave you a, 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 a nugget about hearing from God, understanding the way God speaks. The things that we have read in here were said by God, but not every one of it was in the voice of God. There was a voice, a loud voice that came out of heaven. Could have been the same voice of that angel that John saw, who was, excuse me, who was this mighty being whose voice was like thunder. But that person spoke on the behalf of God. Many a times the reason why we're so perturbed and we're so bothered about what's going on in the world is because we miss the voice of the messengers of God. We miss that loud voice that is coming out of heaven. You miss the voice of prophets like myself, the voices of the ones crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Crying and saying that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kind of messages that I preach have become unpopular because many people want me to talk about how we're going to fix the world, how we're going to organize protests and rallies. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm not preaching about fixing because what I have come to declare is that the kingdom of God is at hand. A new kingdom is coming. A new world is coming. A new Jerusalem is coming. You may not like it, but it is the truth. And the reason why you don't like it is because you have not learned how to hear from God yourself. The ones who hear from God. I was talking to my brother the other day and the things that were coming out of my mouth, mouth was bringing joy to his heart and he was responding as a, as a witness also. And then I was filled with joy because both of us separately, individually, have heard from God. And so when we came together collectively, we were just witnesses to one another. And so if you have heard what God is saying, then you will believe my testimony and rejoice at my teachings. Because it is time for you to stop focusing on fixing that whole house. It is time for you to stop spending all your time trying to call this electrician or that plumber. It is time for you to lift up your heads. Jesus says when you see that the house that you live in and the world that you live in is falling into disarray, is getting more dilapidated. He said that is not the time for you to try to save this and save that. I mean, of course, you save souls. That's what you do. He said, but it is the time for you to lift up your eyes because your redemption is near. So I prophesy over you today that you will lose all that grip that the world has on you that is keeping you in the mundane when in fact your thoughts are supposed to have elevated to heaven. Let me tell you something, nobody gets the heaven body first. You get to heaven soul first. Your attention, your soul, your mind has to first of all be fixed on the things of heaven and then your body will catch up eventually when the time comes. Let your attention be on things above and not on things below. I know somebody sent me a message the other day and it says to me, he said, but Pastor Moses, we cannot keep quiet when evil men are perpetrating evil. We need to do something. Yes, we do need to do something. I know because evil flourishes when good men keep quiet. We need to do something. And what you need to do, what you and I need to do is spelled out in the Bible. And what we need to do is we need to pray. We need to pray. The Bible says the spirit and the bride say come. We need to say by the Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus, come. We need to pray and ask him to come. 
And then each and every one of us will receive a personal revelation of the part that we need to play. Not going and judging by the consensus of opinion of what people in your political party are doing. Not going by what the people in your neighborhood are doing. But going by what the Lord has revealed to you. He said upon this rock of personal revelation. Not by flesh and blood. But by my father in heaven. Will I build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against personal revelation. Stop running with the crowd and let your feet be led by the Holy Spirit. The way to say goodbye and be happy is to know that what you're leaving behind is a falling ship and now God has given you the glorious opportunity of stepping into a new heaven and then coming to a new Jerusalem eventually. But you need to hear from God. And you need to know that there is something coming and it is better. And lastly, the third thing that I said today is that the Father made all things new. Let us look forward to the new. We're not fixing this, guys. We're leaving this behind. One day you will remember that the Lord sent you a John the Baptist, that the Lord sent you one in the spirit of Elijah, even, if, even though his name is Moses. And he says to you, Get ready for the new thing that the Lord is doing. I'm going to leave you with this thought, guys. I am not the type to stir up controversy. By the grace of God, I try not to, even though sometimes it's not avoidable. But I try not to, right? But today, I'm going to, I'm going to say something because I know you need to hear it. The church is not the bride of Christ. And don't, don't stop the broadcast just yet. Yes, I know you just screamed blasphemy. No, listen to me and listen real good. You will not find in that Bible that is in your hand that the church is the bride of Christ. I know you're thinking of this scripture that says husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church that he gave himself for her. The Bible did not say husband love your wives as Christ loves the church, the bride. No, we were the ones who added that over time. It is not in the Bible. When Jesus was speaking, he said when they asked him about his disciples not fasting, he says the friends of the bridegroom do not fast while the bridegroom is with them, but they fast when he is taken away. You and I are friends of the bridegroom. We are not the bride. I think there are just a total number of five times in the New Testament that the word bride was mentioned. And once I'm done, I'm going to tell you the reason why I decided today by the Holy Spirit to then say this bold statement. The Lord revealed something to me and I'm going to share it with you in a moment. I, and that has constituted my reason for coming out to shoot down this sacred cow and to hopefully let it lay to rest forever in your heart. That you are not the bride of Christ. You are the friend of the bridegroom. We are called the body of Christ. Not the bride of Christ. Let me show you. There are five places in the New Testament in total where the word bride is mentioned. Can we go through them together? All of the five places where the word bride is mentioned. In Revelation 22, 17, the Bible says, And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that hear it say, Come. And let him that is thirsty come, and whosoever, let them drink freely of the water. He says, Let the spirit and the bride say, Come. We are not the bride. We are singing. We are the ones who speak by the Holy Spirit. We speak by the unction of the Holy Spirit. John, what John was saying here is pretty much a reiteration of Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 11 where the Lord was saying there will be a new city, there will be a new bride for the ones who are thirsty to come and drink. You see what I mean? In fact, let's see if we can look at that together. Jeremiah 33, 11. The Bible says that the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, praise the Lord of hosts. The ones who have been in captivity, who have been thirsty, they will come to this new bride. That bride is not you. 
It isn't me. It isn't the body of Christ. It is the new Jerusalem. So that new word itself is longing for you to come because you are the body of Christ. You constitute the pillars of the tabernacle that is going to be in that new Jerusalem. Let me, let's, let's even go deeper. Revelations 21 verse 9 talks about the fact that the bride is the lamb's wife. There's no other place in the Bible wherein you would see that we are called the wife of Christ or the bride of Christ. It is misconception and it is a doctrine of demons that has come into the church, into the world to steal the joy of many believers. And I'm going to tell you how it works. It's very, very cunning deception of Satan. Let me show you as we were reading Revelation chapter 21 verse 2. It says, and I read, Revelation 21 verse 2. We read it already. I told you. Put a bookmark there. I am coming back to talk about it. And what does it say? It says, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. He was looking from a distance and was like, this looks like a bride adorned for her husband. And by verse 22, when he had come close enough, was like, yeah, it's not even looking like a bride. In fact, it is the bride. We just read that. Revelation 22 verse 17 says it is the bride. Now let us go to Revelation chapter 18 verse 23. There it talks about the bride. John chapter 3 is the very first mention of the word bride in the New Testament. We've gone through all of the mentions of the word bride in the New Testament of the Bible. And you don't see anywhere wherein it says Jesus has a bride called the church. That bride is the new Jerusalem. It has been prepared by the father himself because the Bible says inheritance is not given by fathers, but a good wife is from the Lord. God gave Jesus an inheritance in us. Except the grain of, a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It abides alone. We became his inheritance. But then the new Jerusalem is his bride prepared by the hand. The Bible says that the maker and the builder of that city is God himself. And he built it and brought it to his son and said, now you can live here and I'm going to be here with you. This is your bride. Not the church. Because the church is the body of Christ. The friends of the bridegroom that will come together with him. Why are we using the word friends and body interchangeably? Or why am I? You see, the Bible says there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Your brother is not part of your body. Your brother is somebody, somebody else. But because you are part of the body, you are the body of Christ, you are closer to the head than anything, and that is why he calls you friends. And so we are the ones. Now, let me, let me quickly show you a picture, you know, that just came to my heart right now. When they were asking about fasting, Jesus says when the head is still connected to the body, the body cannot fast because when the head takes in food, it goes into the body. He says, but wait until the head is taking off and then the body will be without a mouth to receive food. The body will fast. The reason why the body of Christ has been deprived, has been in a fast, so to speak, is because the head is up there at the right hand of the Father and he says, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until you are united with me. And then we break the fast. <laughs> it's going to be a glorious morning after the rapture because that is when we actually have break fast. That's when we break the fast. But for now, we are the body of Christ. And when we're united with him together, we will go into the bride, which is the Jerusalem. Someone says, Brother Moses, that is amazing theology. But why is that important? And why did you say that that is deception? It is deception, first of all, because that wasn't what God said. So it's a lie. And secondly, what it does is the fact that many Christians today or many believers today are struggling, some believers I should say, are struggling with leaving the earth behind because of the fact that most times when you have a bride in the time and in the setting that the Bible was written, brides did not really know the bridegroom. They were giving away in marriage. And so when it was time for them to go and get married, their hearts were broken because of the fact that they would miss their siblings. Because most times they had to relocate and move to where the husband, wherever the husband goes, they have to go. And so that bride mentality 
came into the church such that the church does not want to leave the world behind because we were born here. We were born of water. Our journey pretty much started on the earth. Uh, on the earth. And so when it's time for you to leave the earth and focus on heaven, you struggle because you see yourself as a bride who is about to be giving away to a groom that you do not know. And your heart is broken rather than rejoice. But for every groom that is about to receive a bride, the groom is filled with joy and excitement because of the fact that he is about to be given a bride. And so if we continue to think of ourselves as the bride of Christ, we may never find the joy of looking forward to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, talk less of looking forward to the new Jerusalem, the bride herself. So stop calling yourself the bride of Christ because that is not who you are. You are the body of Christ. You are the friend of the bridegroom. And when you're united with the head of the church, which is Christ Jesus himself, together the father brings to you the bride, which is the new Jerusalem. And then you go into her together. Literally, you go into her together. And that is where the pleasure is. If you know, you know. So stop calling yourself the bride. And allow this truth of the word of God to unleash the joy of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. The joy, even the joy of your salvation. And the joy of the new Jerusalem that is set before you. And I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, you would allow this truth to permeate your soul. And break off of you every shackle, every thought, every connection, and every stronghold to the earth. And to this world system that makes you sorrow when you're supposed to be rejoicing. Let those shackles be broken by reason of the anointing in them name of Jesus. Once again, you are not the bride. You are the friend of the bridegroom and the body of Christ. And together with the groom, you are going into the bride, this new Jerusalem. So let your joy be full. Say goodbye to the earth and be happy. God bless you.